six. So two places for, for you to mark. Second Corinthians chapter four. And then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26. There's no other way. And by the way, uh, yesterday I had the joy of getting to drive what is called a supercar, a McLaren, around a, a road track. And uh, I know you asked me, uh, Randy, what, what I have no idea. what it, well, I, I could barely get both feet in in my head in that thing. Hey, I don't know why anybody pay you a quarter of a million dollars to get in a car that you got to have a chiropractor to get out. I don't understand it, you know, but uh, I get, did get to drive it. You know, I, it, I'll never own one, so I might as well just go drive one. It was a gift from my family to get to go do that and uh, considered it a thrill and a joy. And uh, it's very, uh, uh, I, I recommend it for anyone that can get into the car. Amen. His last night on earth it really hit me how it was his last night. Very comfortable. I want your mind to set with me. I want you to uh, really put yourself into this night. You know, when I come to church, I think about what Jesus did for us. And the love that he shed. The scripture says that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, which means that while I'm serving him, it, the love is even more than it was before that all the good things that come into my life have come from a very good, good God. You know, Job said, can we accept good and not bad? So even when the bad comes, I believe if it's not God's sin, it can be God used. And God's constantly using things in my life for the betterment. Uh, the late Bishop Tony Miller said that, uh, that God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you that the things we're going through is a preparation time. And even if you're close to the end of your life here, you're pre being prepared for the kingdom to come. Amen. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't always have to do with an age time. It's just how your time here on this earth. And you'll never be the person you can be if pressure and tension and discipline are taken out of your life. What I found with particularly American believers is we don't like tension. We don't like pressure. And we're surely not fond of discipline. And yet these are the things who made us who we are. Amen. So when they come into your life, you've got to say, God, I accept that and, and help me to grow into this moment. So over the next, and I, I'll say the next few weeks, not just after, not just till Easter. I, I want to carry on with it. This is going to be more evident than before. Second Corinthians 4, 17. Paul the Apostle said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This light affliction, light affliction, but a moment. That moment could be a season to Jesus. It was his hour. It was the determination factor of what would happen the night that he entered the Garden of Gethsemane. The Message Bible says uh, these hard times are small potatoes <laughs> compared to the coming good time, the lavish celebration prepared for us. I've often said that heaven is a party. There's going to be one continual party. Sometimes when I use the word party, your, your mind goes to uh, <clears throat> more lasciviousness, I think is the big word in the Bible. Uh, uh, you know, the, the what you were like before you got born again part. I'm, not talking, about, I'm talking about the party where, where family and friends reconnect again, and there's that overwhelming joy of seeing a loved one you ain't seen in a long time, the excitement of what the Father has prepared for them. I want you to see it again. Uh, the, the small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. God has something prepared for us who love him. Amen. It's going to be an amazing. So you've got to endure. Everybody say endure. You've you got to press through this. You know, this shutdown of our nation over the last year with this pandemic is literally a light affliction. It's not as bad as you've been thinking it is. And, and I sure sure have acted like it ain't been a bad thing matter of fact to the point where some people have been a little bothered with me but they have forgiven me can i get an amen amen they've just said lord jesus bless the preacher he's just that way amen but i've acted like uh listen to me this has been small potatoes i've been through harder stuff than this but i had to watch the nation go through it. i had to watch the people i love go through it i had to watch people uh uh, shake off fear and grab hold of faith to move through it. Amen. But I say according to the word of God, there is a celebration on the way. 
Amen. That's some good things ahead for us. Can I get an amen? But let's look at this night that changed our lives. It's the tragedy of the cross that came after a sequence of, uh, of tragedies that laid down. Domino effects, if you would, from the time that he washed the feet of the disciples, designated the traitor, amen, rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, hallelujah, and then went into the garden. And it all happened in that one night that he entered, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. And when Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Let me go talk to the Father. I need to get along with my dad. I need to know that this night matters to him and that this is my last night. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the prayer that's already gone forth, not only today, but all the way through this week. Lord, or even on the Tuesday nights, Lord, that have been affecting this body of believers so much. Lord, we pray that you give us revelation, understanding of the word of God, and help us to press through the small potatoes to head to the celebration. In Jesus' name, no one shout. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. People ask me at time, Pastor, why do you like the Message Bible? Because it speaks to me where I'm at. Amen. Very seldom do you hear somebody hear small potatoes. I understand small potatoes. That's when you can't afford big potatoes. Amen. They're a lot easier to mash up, too, after you boil them. The word Gethsemane literally means pressure. It was a place of olives. And the olives, in order to get the oil out of the olives, they had to be squeezed. They had to be pressed. So it was uh, amazing that Jesus did not go into a sycamore field. He, he didn't go into a, a, a place of uh, a cacti or any cactus or, or a place like that. But he went into a place called uh, of oil field. He went into the place of Gethsemane. He went into the olive fields, if you would. Amen. The word there, this press, press, to, to weigh down, to be burdened, uh, from a base word that means profound. It was a mystery and difficult to fathom, understand, extending far below the surface. In other words, the disciples didn't understand what was going on. They didn't, they couldn't figure out, excuse me, what it was that Jesus was fixing to go through. And as he told them, I want you to sit here while I'm going to go pray yonder. And I've often used this phrase, and I know you've been with me, some of you, a long time. So you've heard me preach on this. But Jesus actually uses the word in the King James, sit you here while I go pray yonder. Yonder is a southern term. Can I get an amen? Amen. No Yankee ever used the word yonder. It's down here in the south. We say go over yonder. Amen. So Jesus was a southern boy, and I just got to stand on that. He, uh, this thing was a mystery. It was unexplained to the disciples what was going to happen, obscure to them. It was like a secret, but it all happened in one night. He said to them, sit. The pressure, when pressure is on, i got to say this to you repetitively, wait. When you feel pressure, that's why when the pandemic hit, pandemonium broke out and people began to panic. My word to the body of Christ was wait, listen, hear the Spirit of the Lord. What does he say? Don't follow the masses into this pandemic. Amen. Pay attention. Use some common sense. Common sense was so important to me last year and even through this year. When I, I, I hear people say to me, uh, well, don't, don't be bothered by me. I've been vaccinated. Good. And why you got the mask on? Well, because they told me to. If I'm being vaccinated, then I shouldn't have to have to wear the mask or stay six foot away. So I got, and I'm not trying to be mean, because I know people are, are they're scared. They, they, they don't want to die too early. But if you believe like me, God sent me to this earth. God will take me from this earth. My exit has already been planned. Amen. And I'm not, you know, listen, I, I got in a, a, a fast car yesterday. Not the one at the track, the one I get in from my driveway. Amen. I, I live life, and you've got to keep living. And, and even if it sounds mean, I, I just got to tell you, you've got to keep living life. You've got to keep pressing on. And here Jesus walked into this place, and he sat and he waited. He, he told the disciples, wait here while I go pray over here. Amen. Over yonder. When the pressure is on and your life is, is de de determined on the hinge, and I'm going to tell you, our future determined on what Jesus would do that night, you got to wait. Everybody say, wait. Psalm 62, 1, David said, My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. My soul finds rest in him alone. What I find interesting with David is, if you think of David, let me just think of this David here. David's two boys have no weight in them. Have you seen that? 
If you watch Benaiah and Josh, they have no weight. Some of your kids I've already seen, they're that way. They, they're, they're spontaneous, they go, they move, they, they can't be still. And when I think of David in the Bible, he's that way. He is the goer, he's a mover, he's a shaker, he's, he's in the cave, he's in the palace, he's taking out a giant, he's taking care of the sheep, he's slinging stones, he's shooting arrows, amen, he's going into the cave, he's dealing with Saul, he's go, go, go. But something happened to him when he realized the revelation and the understanding of his life was to wait on God, that if I will just make myself wait. And sometimes you've got to, some folk waiting seems to be easy for them. They can stand in line. They can get in traffic and not be bothered. But then there are those men and women that's got that spirit in them of go. G-O, it's just got to move. It's got to be faster. They get upset. Amen. They, they, they got to get to the next place so they can wait again. Uh-huh. Amen. So David said, listen, it's something that I've learned is that my soul finds rest in God alone. That whenever I learn to wait on him, he's my rock, he's my salvation, he's my fortress, I'll never be shaken. Isaiah the prophet used the phrase many of us have used before, but they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. There's something that comes through prayer. There's something that comes through waiting. There's something that says, if I could just get still and hear his voice in the night when all the disturbance and pandemic and trouble is all around me, when the pressure is squeezing on me, if I could just wait on the Lord, he'll renew my strength. Amen. Not only will he do that, I'll mount up with wings as eagles. I can run and I won't be weary. Amen. I'll walk and I'll not faint. But I've got to learn the secret of waiting, of getting into I know some of you business owners, you want to go, go, go. And some of your moms, you got your kids and you go, go, go. And and we got this, this. But if I can just take, it doesn't take a long time, just a moment. Just to breathe and say, God, what's next? I'd rather believe biblical truth than the truth that I'm seeing pumped onto the news. I want to live by the Word of God. I've said it for years, but now I want to do it. I want to live by this. Amen. And in this night, he said, I want you to wait. I want you to wait. In other words, i got to make you strong. i got to give you strength. It was a night of suffering and sorrow. Verse 37 through 39 tells us that. If I go to Luke chapter 22, verse 44, it says, And being in anguish, she prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Had Jesus known, and this is the thing that, that confounds me, had he known that when he went into the garden and began to pray, and we know that he knows all things, and, and we also know that God sent an angel to comfort him, but, but he, had he, evidently he just kind of put all that aside, but his body began to feel the pressure, and blood began to pop out of his pores. Amen. The word is hermatidrosis, the medical term. It's to be under such, such pressure that the capillaries, amen, and the sweat begins to pop, and then the blood pops, and now, now there's bruising in the body, and this thing is going on, and it makes one weak, amen. The garden manifested its own pressure, amen, weighed him down, burdened him. It was, again, a deep mystery. It was uh, difficult to fathom or understand, but as he's praying, who's he praying for? Yes, himself, but for you, for me, this is the wheat that will go into the ground. He doesn't say it. He said if wheat goes to the ground and dies alone, it abides alone. But, but if it dies with purpose, if, if it germs inside the ground, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it'll bring forth much fruit. Did you know that when a donor dies, a donor dies and they give up their heart and their liver and their kidneys, that others are living through their death. And when Jesus died, according to Isaiah, God gained many sons and daughters through the blood that he poured out on on Golgotha's hill. When I read this, it's profound to me. The fight for our salvation, the hard decision to go to the cross, it all happened in one night. For three, who are they? Peter, JJ, James, and John. For those three, they, they're supposed to be waiting. Amen. But Jesus found them sleeping. Sleeping is not waiting. Sleeping is not watching. Amen. If you've ever worked, I used to work for a group called Wacken Hut. It was a security company when I was in college. And one of the things I had to do was secure uh, places at night. I worked a 11 to 7 shift, and I went to college during the day, and I told a shotgun. 
And the thing is, is that you would find yourself in a place where nobody else is around. Watching and waiting, watching and waiting, watching and waiting. I don't know if any of you else work night shift. Know what I'm talking about. But that watching and waiting can get to you. And there are three are way outside. Amen. And it's a natural desire under pressure just to take a nap. Verse 39 says, he went a little further and he fell on his face. He prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it would be possible, let this cup. Everybody say cup. Amen. Pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples. So he's done. He's been praying for some time. He comes back to his disciples and, and he found them asleep. And he said unto Peter, why could you not watch with me one hour in my mind? I see him shake him, kick him. Amen. Wake him up. And Peter wakes up and looks at him. And he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing. But your flesh, my friend, is weak. He went away again a second time. And he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, your will be done. He came and he found them asleep again the second time for their eyes were heavy he left them and he went away again and he prayed the third time saying the same words then he came unto his disciples and he said unto them sleep on now now listen i've heard people rebuke people pastors rebuke church folk said look once you pray something you don't have to pray it again i disagree with that there are times that i will repeat myself God has heard me. I'm like a child after a mother or a father. I'm not going to back off until I get what I'm after. So he prays, not my will. Let this cup pass from me. Let this, this, this thing pass from me. I, I don't want to do with it. I don't, my flesh has already bruised up. I've already been bleeding in this garden. But now is a time of surrender for him. Amen. This night, and you're never going to forget this night. Under pressure, you're seeking for decisions. Dictated by peace. Let peace lead you. You, you hear that you've got surgery coming. Let peace lead you. You hear something's going on in your life financially. Let peace lead you. It's the peace of God that leads us through troubled times. A lot of people, they wonder, how are you able to handle this? I feel peace. I feel peace. Peace is adjusting your life to the will of God. It's taking out all the static of your life. And it'll always be static. So find peace. Peace is such, it's worth fighting for. It's worth paying. Amen. Whatever it takes to get peace in your life, get peace peace amen so here jesus finally gets to a place of peace when after the third prayer not my will it ain't about what i want to do but what you want to do so first he surrenders to what i call deity to god himself god i surrender you know how hard it is to surrender to god you've been fighting with god your whole born again life amen you've been wanting to do this in the flesh and god says ah that's always got you in trouble. So you fight with him. You wrestle with him. Your mind struggles with him. You have these, these, uh, these dreams about doing these things. And God says, uh-uh, I didn't give you that dream. Pizza did. So you got to back away from it. you got to wrestle with it. So Jesus first, even though we wrestle, he wrestled three times. Not my will, not my will, not my will. Three times he, he deliberately, if this cup will be taken away from me, let it be taken away. And I've often talked about the cup. Because the cup to me has the foam, it has the liquid, it has the dregs. It has the physical part that's going to take place when they're going to beat his body, they're going to pierce his brow, they're going, they're going to nail him to But here in the garden is when he makes up his mind. A man and woman who's made up their mind will do the impossible. Because you've already made up your mind. It wasn't the cross that saved us, actually. It was the garden. Because it's in the garden that he makes up his mind. He decides right then, I can handle the top. And then the mental part is with knowing that people you've loved that you poured your life into are going to desert you. They're going to forsake you. He knew that was going to happen. Amen. And then the dregs is simply, when we'll get to it probably next week, is when God himself turned his back on his own son. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's, that's the dregs. And if you don't know what dregs are, you've never drunk a, a, a cup of coffee in the, in the 70s. Before there was Keurig, amen. When you, when you brewed that pot and you watched that, that percolator perk, Kenny, and you seen it pop up in that little glass, you, some of you ain't got no idea what I'm talking about, amen. But it perk up like that, and then you got that first cup, second cup, third. but by the time you get to that bottom cup, Mr. Richard, you don't want any more of that because that's where the dregs are. That's where the bitter, that's where you're going to spit. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what Jesus, he was at the dregs there to come. Then he did, then he did to the disciples, he surrendered. I mean, he went on surrender. When you finally give up, when you finally say, God, okay, I'll do what you've asked me to do. So he surrenders to God. Then he walks out and he sees the disciples the third time, and they're still sleeping. And what did he say? Sleep on now. Sleep on. Rest on. Did you know he understands your humanity? He understands how much you've been through in life. He knows that there are times that, you know, I ask you to wait, I ask you to pray, but now you're snoring, and I love you anyway. And I say, snore on, sleep on. You ain't got no idea what this night's going to be like. You think my life is going to change? Your lives are going to change forever. Because you're going to see them take me away. You're going to see them beat me. You're going to want to stop it. You're not going to be able to. They're going to put me in the ground. You're going to think I'm dead, but I'm going to resurrect. You don't understand that right now, but you will. So I want you to sleep on. And I see these three guys sleeping. Oh, I see James laid out with a big old snore. I see John, amen, with his head on his brother James's chest, using it like a pillow. Then I look and I see that at the feet of James, nasty feet. There's Peter snuggled up to his feet. He always had feet near his mouth. Amen. He's just that way. He, he, had, he had toe jam issues. Amen. He snuggled up down there. Jesus looks at him. They're sleeping. Rest on, boys. Sleep on. Amen. And then there was a sound of 600 soldiers coming up the road. And here they come, swords clanging on their side, being led by Malchus, the servant of the high priest, and being led by Judas Iscariot, who has 30 pieces of silver now in his pocket. They're coming up. Judas knows where Jesus is. He knows what his custom is. So they're coming up the road, and Jesus hears them coming. He wakes up his disciples, and now he's fixing to surrender again. He's going to surrender to a deceiver. As he comes up the road, he looks at him, and he says, uh, he, matter of fact, you know what he said? He said, friend, what did you come for? When's the last time that somebody stabbed you in the back, you called them friend? And somebody did you wrong after you washed their feet, did you call them friend? Jesus is demonstrating what he's been preaching and what the Word of God has shared from Genesis to Revelation. To forgive those who despitefully use you, amen, your enemies, amen, learn how to forgive them. Friend, friend, what, what did you come for? Not fiend, but friend. No, really, what was your real intention or motivation for getting close to me? Even the book of Psalms tells us in chapter 41, verse 9, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That term is a run. It's to trip somebody up. You, you meant to try to trip me. You meant to try. I shared my bread with you. I looked after you, and here you are trying to trip me. Judas, Judas is a mystery. In all theology, Baptist, Church of Christ, Pentecostal, he, 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 everybody preaches him a little bit different. They got a di so, some people think he was born to go to hell. I have never believed that God ever intended for somebody to go to hell. Amen. They, it wasn't, they, that, he wasn't set up for that. But he is a mystery. Like no other disciple fascinates the mind like Judas. All the others we can understand, but even Peter. But Judas remains a mystery, wrapped up in a riddle. What made him tick? Was he crooked from the beginning? Question. In his hands, Judas held the little bag that contained the 30 pieces of silver of deception. Had he even bothered to count it? No one noticed him now. It was like he was yesterday's news. No one had any use for him. He's a traitor. Through the long night, he had waited, hanging around the edges of the crowd, listening for some word of how things were going. What exactly did he expect? No one knows for sure. But if at midnight he wanted to see Jesus die or to see Jesus slip through the crowd like he always had done, by sunrise he had changed his mind. Memories kept gripping Judas. Amen. Things Jesus had done. Little jokes the apostles used to tell. Stories Jesus had told over and over again. Little pictures painted themselves in the darkness. The smile on the face of Jairus' daughter. But Jesus raised her from the dead. The look of Peter's face when he walked on the water. And it actually held him up. The picture of those 12 baskets of food that were left over after Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children. He could see it all and hear it all. And the memories were almost too much to bear. Hey, Saint, that moment when you decided that you wanted to walk away from God, and I'm not just speaking to all of you, but anybody that's watching, do you have those memories? I have so many memories of what God has done in my life that they would haunt me to stay away from Him, to walk away from Him. With a thought filling his mind, he took the bag of money and tried to give it back, but the chief priest laughed at him. They had no more use for him or for his money. They had what they wanted. 
many people who truly feel sorry for their sins. They never come to God and ask for forgiveness. And this was the problem with Judas. He never came back to God and asked for forgiveness. Instead, in remorse and sadness or whatever you want to say, he tried to undo the betrayal. It was too late. I do not doubt that he wept bitter tears as he threw the money back into the temple. Let me mention this to you as Joseph comes. Hurting people hurt people. When you've been hurt, and I, I, I may not can prove this, but I see in Scripture where Jesus, his feet are being washed by Mary, and she dumps the alabaster upon his feet, and it was Judas who said, that could have been used to, been, to, so, to, be, to sell and give it to the poor. And the Scripture says, Judas said this because his hand was in the bag, that he wanted the money for himself. And Jesus said, why? Leave her alone. What she's doing is for my memorial. Amen. She's breaking a vase for me. She's doing extravagance for me. She's doing something nobody else would do. She has lived a life of prostitution. Amen. Her life is turned back around toward me. I, I'm, I'm going to let her worship. I'm going to let her tears flow over my body. Amen. I'm going to let her wipe my feet with her hair. Don't you get on to her, Judas. What she's done is extravagant. There are times you need to do something extravagant for God. Amen. You need to break a vase. Amen. You need to let some fragrance out. You need to come to church and allow yourself to be broken. Say, God, I just love you. I just love you. You're so good to me. My life would have never changed without you. And there will always be a Judas somewhere in the house that's bothered by you. They know your past. They know who you were like. They know about your lying, your scheming. They know all about the things that you were arrested for. They, they look at you like, what do you think you're doing? Let them look. Let them look. You just close your eyes. Let your tears flow down and give him thanks for a new life, a new day, a new opportunity. Judas, Judas was hurt, hurting people, hurt people. I'm going to break it down just a little bit more for you. I've always used the what I call the four A's. Anger always assassinates authority. That whenever you get angry and you don't deal with it properly, and surely you're going to get angry. Anger, ang the Jesus, the, the Ephesians says, Paul mentioned this, that, that it's okay to be angry, just don't let the sun go down on it. In other words, give you some time to get over it. Amen. Don't stay mad all the time. Amen. Sometimes I look at folk and say, doggone, are you laying on a cucumber? Why don't you roll over to the other side? Amen. You, you're wearing us out. You're always mad. You're always upset. You get, get over it. Amen. It happened a long time ago. Who you mad at is dead. Amen. If not, they ought to be dead. But to you, don't let it just keep wearing on you. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Been through enough life to understand. Let it go. Don't stay angry. Anger always assassinates authority. Well, I've watched children whose parents have loved them, cared for them, looked after them, provided for them. And that anger would turn back around and try to assassinate that parent. Because kids know about you like nobody else does. They know you've got stuff hidden. They've seen things that have said in the house. They've heard you arguing with your spouse in anger. They, they got memory. They can throw things back at you. Well, my daddy, well, my, my dad, I love my pop. And one of the things that I learned as I got older is he was not perfect. Oh, he, he did things out of anger. I have memories of. But I will not throw my dad under the bus. Hey, Amen. I remind myself, he just... He did the best he could. Amen. My mom posted yesterday when she saw me driving down the highway. She said, you're a wild child. I posted back. I said, you raised me. She said, she said yeah, I, I did, but I didn't have time to train you. Well said, Mama. Well said. That's Judas. He's angry. Bitterness in his, in his heart. He's betrayed to Christ. He comes up the road. Jesus wakes up, the disciples, they're waking up. Peter sees Judas, Malchus. I believe Malchus had to be up front. He's the, he's the point of the spear. And Peter grabs out his sword. Oh, my goodness. 
flies that thing in the night. Mm. And that head, duck. And that ear, comes off. Malchus's ears, I mean, this is like watching a movie in my mind as I see that ear come off and <laughs> falls to the ground. The soldiers begin to draw their swords. And there's Peter standing all by himself with a sword. It don't say James and John pulled their swords. It just said Peter pulled his sword. So you got one against 600. There at that moment, you realize what's going to happen? They're going to kill Peter, justifiably kill him, because he's taking Malchus's ear off. Malchus's ear laying on the ground. There he goes. Being Jesus. He looks at the situation. This is not something he had planned. I don't know if he was praying God spoke to him and said, by the way, Jesus, even though this night is all about you, you're still going to have to deal with Peter. <laughs> even though this is all about eternity, going to change forever because of what you're going to agree to do, you're still going to have to deal with Peter. Maybe that'd make a great sermon, Ken. You still got to deal with Peter. Hey, Amen. you got to deal with him. What are you going to do now? So here's Peter with blood on his sword, dripping, a man's ears laying in the sand. Malchus has got his head like this. Blood's running down the side. Judas backs up. I mean, he knew Peter had had a, had a pretty big talk, but he'd never done anything about the big talk. But now he looked like he really wanted to defend Jesus. This is what I should be doing is defending Jesus. said, I betrayed him. And Peter got his sword out. He is flying off. James and John just waking up. Can't believe the scene they're seeing. And Jesus bends down and picks up the ear. Wipes off the dirt. He looks Malchus right in the face. Eyeball to eyeball. He takes the ear and puts it right back on his head. I've got scars from stitches that took a long time to heal. That fast. Because this is a need for a miracle. Because if this ear don't stick, they're going to kill Peter and ruin this whole night. So you can't tell me that Malchus didn't reach up there and do this. I think, I think when Malchus died, one earlobe was longer than the other. I think he pulled on that ear all the time. I think when they were taking Jesus into the proctorium to beat him, he pulled on his ear. I think when they lifted him up and dropped him in the ground, nailed to the cross, he pulled on his ear. I think when they took him down and put him in Nicodemus' tomb, he pulled on his ear. Hold on. This is the man. This is the guy who was crucified. This is the guy who blasphemed God. This is the guy who you tell me is wicked. This is Jesus the Christ. Ah, I must be missing something here. And then probably the saddest of the whole story, the Scripture says they departed from him and they forsook him. Amen. But this was all taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled and all the disciples deserted. This is that part of the cup that you don't want. It's at the end. Peter, put up your sword. You live by it, you're going to die by it. And then he allowed them to be taken away. Now, I don't know how far we'll get next week, but I can tell you this. Peter stayed from a distance. That boldness that he had after he woke up is now gone. He's warming himself by the fires of the world. Matter of fact, <laughs> Peter remembered his curse words. Some of y'all that have been born again a long time, do you still remember any of your cuss words? Funny how they come back to you quite quickly. They did to Peter. And Jesus said to him, he said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. I'll never never deny you prophetically he did three times he denied him then the rooster crow 
Oh, that's for another time. Heads bowed, eyes closed. One of my favorite scriptures out of the book of Hebrews tells us that God would never, never forsake us. Never forsake us. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. When you have been forsaken, when you have been left, when you've been betrayed, deserted, all of a sudden you learned a lesson. I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. I want you to know this. Through this pandemic, through the small potatoes, through everything in life that's thrown at you, and Jesus has never forsaken you. He's never left you. Amen. So that you could boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man or this world do to me? If you've been away from God, would you just throw your hand up and pull it back down? Thank you. Thank you. Amen. A couple of hands in the house. Those watching online, you can pray with us too. Those hands that were lifted, let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you'll never forsake me. You'll never leave me. I can boldly say, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. Help me prepare myself for a future to come. I thank you. You're my strength. I will learn to wait in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. What a story. What a true story. There's so much in there. I could preach this for weeks, man. I got to be careful. Real careful. I love it. Because now we're going to take to the cross. He's going to be lied about. They're going to try to find evidence. A wife is going to go to a leader and say, I had a dream about that man, and he is innocent. Pilate washes his hands of uh, the guilt that he's feeling, but he's gone too far to back away. And this story comes alive. Amen. As we move through this week, make sure you take some time to read all the way up to the resurrection. Amen. And prepare your heart. This, this is a great time. When I talk with people, when I witness to them about the gospel, this is where I'm going to take them. Amen. I got to take you to the, to the cross. I got to let you know how much he loves you. Amen. In front of you are tithe and offering envelopes. Amen. Please be a giver today. If you give that way, if you give it on your phone, amen, you can go to holywild.net slash give. Our online has gone up. Thank God for that. But uh, we we got to keep we got to keep believing God and honor God with our giving. Can you get an amen? All of our giving is a way to honor God. I mentioned an extravagance. You know, to me, tithing is tithing. It's just it's what I do. But there are times that I will do something extravagant. Amen. Like Mary when she broke the alabaster box. There there are times that I will look around the church and say, I want to do something for the church. I want to do something for God's people. I want to do something a little bit over and above. Amen. This is a great season and time to do that. Amen. As David comes, you know, prepare yourself for giving. Make sure that uh, Justin, good to have you back. Has he been working you hard? You look thinner than you were last time I saw you. Amen. Okay. All right.